we have four distinguished um, guests with us. Um, Reverend Dato Ng Moon Heng, who is the Bishop and Anglican um, Diocese of West Malaysia, and is, who is also the fifth Archbishop of the Anglican province of Southeast Asia from 2016 to 2020. And our next speaker is Reverend Dr. Ezra Kok, who is the current president of Chinese Annual Conference of the Methodist Church, CAC in Malaysia. And he um, served as the um, principal of STM from 2001 to 2014. Um, the next panelist we have is Dr. Alex Tang, um, who is a medical um, uh, pediatrician consultant by profession. Uh, and he is also a regular um, lecturer, lecturer uh, teaches in a number of seminaries in Malaysia and also in the region. The last is Reverend Dr. Lim Kayong, who is currently lecturer uh, of um, New Testament Studies at STM, who is also the Dean of STM KL Center, uh, happened to be my boss, <laughs> and who is the Director of Postgraduate Studies at STM, and also an Anglican uh, priest. So we welcome them. So without much ado, and this is our agenda for the night, and this is the order of the presentation. And we will have Reverend Dr. Lim Gayong to take us through um, Lament in the Gospel of Luke, and followed by Dr. Alex Tang on spirituality of Lament and beyond. Uh, then we have uh, Bishop Ng Moon Hing, moving beyond lament and Reverend Ezra Kok to wrap us up uh, with the topic of lament and the church. And lastly, we will have a Q&A session. So let me pass the time to Reverend Dr. Lim Kayong. Hi, good evening, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to our webinar for this evening on the topic of moving beyond lament. So what I will do in the next uh, um, 12 to 15 minutes is to do a brief a biblical exposition on the theme of lament found in the Gospel of Luke. So let me just go ahead and share my screen with you. When I was a young Christian growing up, I've often been taught that uh, if we, uh, a good model for me to follow when I pray to God is the ACTS model. And I think this model is something, is a model that perhaps quite a number of us are familiar with. We are often exalted that when we come to God in prayer, the first thing that we do is adoration. We adore God for who he is. We acknowledge his greatness. We acknowledge his majesty, that he is the one where we are pouring out our supplication. He is the one that is worthy uh, of our praise and worship. And the next step that we tend to follow is C, uh, which is confession. We come to God acknowledging that we are sinners. We are sinners that are saved by grace. And we come to God, we confess to Him our shortcomings. We confess to Him our sins. We ask Him for His forgiveness. And then there is a T where we give thanks to God. We give thanks to God for the blessings that he has showered upon us. We give thanks to God for the good things that he has blessed us with. We give thanks to God uh, for, our, uh, for our job, for our family, for our friends, for our church. So there's much for us to give thanks. And then the next step is the S, which is supplication, where we pour out our requests, our intercession. We pray for the world. We pray for the church. We pray for the community around us. We pray for the government. We pray for our family, our friends, our relatives. And we also pray for ourselves. So this is a very good model that have guided me. And I'm sure many of us practice this and the ACTS model. Then as I move on in life, as particularly the times when I was um, in the pastoral ministry, I realized that there is another, there is something that is missing in this ACTS model. I'm not suggesting that this model is inadequate. No, that's not what I meant. What I mean is that there seems to be there is a missing L. What is that missing L? The lament. Where is there a place for lament in our prayer? Is there a place for lament in our devotion to God? Is there a place for lament where we could come to God and pour out our hearts to God and perhaps come to God and, and ask God difficult questions that we may not even have 
an answer. If you look at the psalmist, for example, in Psalm 13, we see this as a psalm of David. He poured out his heart to God. He cried out, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Here we see the psalm of David cry out, pour out his heart to God and asking God this question, how long, how long, how long, how long must my enemy pursue me? How long uh, will I endure the injustice that I see? And even the prophet Habakkuk, right from Habakkuk chapter 1, we see Habakkuk also cry out to God when he witnessed the injustice and the suffering of the people. He cried out, how long, Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. God seems to be silent. And so Habakkuk was wrestling with this issue with God. God, why do you make me look at injustice? Why is it that you tolerate wrongdoing, destruction, and violence are everywhere? There's strife, there's conflict. Habakkuk has no answer. In the New Testament, we also see Paul himself lamented, especially in Romans chapter 9, right up to chapter 11, where uh, uh, Paul lament for to God, pouring out his heart to God concerning his fellow Jewish people. Why is that my own Jewish people would not believe in Jesus the Messiah? And Paul himself said that I wish I could be cut off for the sake of my own people. So if you look through the pages of the scripture, there is much there is to talk about the lament. So if you, if you look at lament, lament gives us an emotional language of address to God when life is perplexing, overwhelming, and desperate. And we simply do not have an answer to the challenges that, that, is, that are confronting us, just like what the psalmist did, just like what Habakkuk did, just like what Paul did. So for this evening, for the short time that we have, I'd like uh, to quickly take us through uh, the Gospel of Luke, where, there's a, where the Gospel of Luke uh, is very rich in lament. I'm just going to quickly highlight four incidents that we can find in Luke chapter 7. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Luke chapter 7 and follow along with me as I do a brief exposition on some of these uh, passages. The first passage I'd like to look on, look at is Jesus and the centurion whose slave was ill. So if you read in Luke chapter 7 from verse 1 right up to verse 10, a Jesus returned to Capernaum. And then a centurion servant, a centurion who is most likely a Gentile, he has a servant and his servant is very, very ill and was about to die. So this centurion, uh, you might want to describe him as someone who is very sympathetic to the Jewish faith. In fact, Luke tells us he is the one that has contributed uh, money to build the synagogue uh, in Capernaum. So those of you who were with me on last Tuesday in my talk on encountering the Holy Land, we have seen the synagogue uh, in Capernaum. So it was this centurion who has contributed money to the building of the synagogue. So this century uh, uh, went to the Jewish leaders and asked the Jewish leader to approach Jesus on his behalf, to ask the Lord to come and heal his servant. So here we see the centurion lamenting and pleading with Jesus uh, uh, for his slave that he loves so much that is ill and is near death. So Jesus went uh, to his house and before he could arrive, the century sent out uh, a message to Jesus, Lord, don't, don't have to come, you know. I, I, I'm, I don't deserve, I, I, I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. So please say the word and I and my servant will be healed. And Jesus said that and Jesus was amazed at the faith of the centurion. Here you see a centurion, uh, someone that is in position of authority and yet was so helpless when he saw his slave was ill. He cried out to Jesus and asked Jesus, Lord, say the word, please say, so that my servant will be healed. And that was the faith that the centurion had. So when the centurion poured out his lament 
to Jesus. He has this deep faith within him that his slave will be healed. And then as we move on in the Gospel of Luke, uh, the next incident, we see Luke records for us uh, a very pitiful situation. And in verse 11 to verse 17, Jesus traveled to a town called Nain, and there was a large crowd together with him. So when he arrived at the city, a dead person was being carried out. And Luke tells us in verse 12 that this is the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and the mother was weeping. And the mother was lamenting, crying out because all whatever hope that she had, she, she had for the son was all gone. And you tell us she was a widow. First of all, this woman was a widow, which means she has no husband. So she had to rely on the son so that she will be able to survive. And now her only hope for, of survival, which is her son, was suddenly taken away from her. So where is hope for this a widow who has lost his son? How is he going to face tomorrow? How is he going to face the future where there is no hope? There's no prospect of anyone providing for her materially, emotionally. And all her support was suddenly pulled away under her feet. And she is lost. And Jesus saw her, his heart went out to her and said, don't cry. And Jesus restored the young man, the son of the widow, back to her. Here again, we see this widow uh, crying out uh, from the depth of her pain. Then we move on to the next incident in John chapter 7, where we see John the Baptist. John the Baptist is now in, um, 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 imprisoned. And then he called his two disciples to him and said, Look, can you please go to our Lord, go to Jesus, and I want you to ask him one question. So John the Baptist began to doubt about Jesus' ministry. John the Baptist, early on in the beginning of his ministry, he has been baptizing people by the river Jordan. John the Baptist baptized uh, our Lord Jesus himself. And John the Baptist has always been telling the people, repent, repent, repent and bear fruit. So if you don't bear fruit, the axe huh, is already at, at the chopping board. They're going to chop off the tree the, if you don't bear fruit. So you're going to be chopped off if you don't bear fruit. He even told the tax collector, collect no more. You know, even uh, rebuked uh, the soldiers, do not extort money from people. Because John the Baptist believed that when Jesus came into the picture, there will be judgment. But suddenly, as John was imprisoned, when he heard news being delivered to him about the ministry of Jesus, John realized that there is no judgment. I have been preaching a message of judgment, but where is judgment? I only see Jesus heal the sick, Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus perform miracles, and Jesus forgives the sins of people. So in verse 19, he sent two of his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? So in his moment of doubt, where John the Baptist could not reconcile the message that he preached and what he saw in the ministry of Jesus, he sends his disciples to Jesus to ask this question. So the disciples went to ask Jesus, John the Baptist asked, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? So Jesus replied and told the disciples, you go back and you tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is the one who does not stumble on account of me. Jesus essentially cites Isaiah chapter 60, reminding John that he is the one that has been anointed by the Spirit of the Lord to proclaim the good news to the poor. Now is a time of the favor of the Lord. Yes, judgment will come, but not now. Judgment will surely come later on. But now is the year of the Lord's favor. So we see even in doubt, John the Baptist poured out his lament. And finally, the fourth incident that we're going to look at is in Luke chapter 7, verse 36 and following. Here, we see 
that Simon the Pharisee invited Jesus to have dinner in his house. And then suddenly, a woman who has a rather notorious reputation in town, a sinful a woman, you might want to call her a prostitute, she quietly slipped into um, the Pharisee's house and then she broke at the alabaster jar of perfume that she brought along. And then at the feet of Jesus weeping, she began to wet the feet of Jesus with her tears and then wipe them with her hair, kiss them and pour perfume on them. So you can imagine when the woman poured the alabaster jar of perfume, the aroma filled the room. And Simon the Pharisee was upset. Simon the Pharisee uh, said to himself in verse 39, if this man is a prophet, he would have known who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus sensed what Simon the Pharisee was saying. So Jesus told a parable uh, to Simon the Pharisee. Two people owe money to a certain money lender. One owe 500 denarii, the other 50. Both of them have no money to pay. So the money lender forgave the debts of both. Which one would love him more? Simon said, I suppose the one who had a bigger debt. Forgiven. So Jesus said, you have judged correctly. And Jesus told Simon, when I come to your house, you do not wash my feet. But this woman wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Simon did not give Jesus a kiss, but this woman kissed his feet. Simon did not put oil on his head, but this woman poured perfume on his feet. So what we see is that this woman did everything that a host supposed to do. If you are a Jewish host and you invite someone to your house, the first thing they will do to your guests is you get a slave to wash the feet of the guests. But no one washed Jesus' feet. You, you greet the guests with a holy kiss, but Simon did not do so. Not only that, you annoy the forehead of your guests with perfume so that everyone will feel fresh as you enter the house. Simon did not do that. He didn't do that. So what Simon was doing is he was setting up Jesus to be ashamed. Can you imagine you go into someone's house? No one welcome you. No one wash your feet. No one kiss you. No one anoint you with oil. Can you imagine you walk into the house with smelly feet that everyone knew that you are invited, but you are not invited. But this woman came to Jesus and did everything that Simon was supposed to do. She kissed Jesus' feet. She washed Jesus' feet and she anointed Jesus' feet. So that's why Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. So this woman knew that she is sinful. She has no right to come to Jesus. But out of her lament, out of the morn, uh, uh, her mourning, she came to Jesus because she realized that she is a sinner and she wants to turn away from her sinful life. And she came to Jesus and Jesus acknowledged that. And then as we move on the Gospel of Luke, we also see that Jesus lamented for Jerusalem. In Luke uh, chapter 13, uh, Jesus said this to Jerusalem, 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 you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, we will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And on Palm Sunday, surely when Jesus was entering Jerusalem, this would have been the view that we see today if you were to go down, if you go to Jerusalem and walk down the Palm Sunday Road, would you have seen the, uh, uh, the Temple Mount, right, the Dome of the Rock, the Awaza Mosque, here would have been the Jerusalem Temple. So in the time of Jesus, as Jesus marched into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, this is what Jesus would have seen. Jesus would have seen the glorious temple, and yet Jesus wept for Jerusalem. Today on Mount Olive, if we were to visit the place, we can actually visit a church that commemorating the weeping of Jesus. And this church is called Dominus Flavit on Mount of Olives. It was built actually in the shape of a teardrop with a tear bottle. And as you enter the church from inside, and this is what you see on your flyer, it was taken inside the church at the altar. Right at the altar, you see this window. As you look out 
you see the cross. As you look forward, you see the Dome of the Rock. This would have been the Temple of Jerusalem. If you look further on behind this, this is where the Church of Holy Sepulchre is, and this is where Calvary is. So in other words, when the architect designed this church to commemorate Jesus' weeping of Jerusalem from the altar, when you look out, you see the Temple of Jerusalem, and Jesus wept over it. Further away is where Jesus was crucified on Calvary. Jesus himself wept for Jerusalem. So what can we learn uh, from the Gospel of Luke about lament? First of all, I'd like to suggest that lament is our acknowledgement of our brokenness, the brokenness of the world we live in and our own weaknesses. We recognize that we are mortals. There's a lot of things that's beyond us that we have no answer. We can only look to God. Just like the centurion coming to Jesus, pleading with her, uh, with him to heal the servant. And lament is also our expression of our intimacy and confidence with God. We can approach God because of who he is, just like the sinful woman who came to anoint the feet of Jesus. Because she has this deep confidence that Jesus will accept her simple act of devotion to him. And lament is so also our entreaty for God to act, just like the centurion, pleading with Jesus, Lord, say the word and my servant will be healed. And lament is also our participation in the pain of others. Lament sometimes is not about ourselves. It's also the pain of others, the injustice we see around in our world. Uh, just like the centurion uh, pour out his heart to Jesus on behalf of his slave. Jesus, when he saw Jerusalem, he cried out uh, to God concerning Jerusalem because the people had turned away from God. Just like Habakkuk, when he sees the injustice around him, he cry out to God because of the pain and the suffering of people. So lament um, allow us to identify with the pain of the people. But more importantly, lament is not our final prayer, but it is a prayer in the meantime with eschatological hope. It is a prayer for the now with the hope that God will surely act. That's why we see uh, the psalmist when, they, when the psalmist pour out his lament to God in Psalm 13, that the, the lament doesn't end by itself. At the end of Psalm 13, we see that the psalmist say, I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. So lament, uh, draw our attention to God, the almighty one, the sovereign one, knowing that he will surely act one day, but not necessarily according to our time, but according to his time. Habakkuk the prophet as well, he poured out his lament and yet at the end of uh, Habakkuk chapter 3, he says that even though the fig tree may not blossom, you know what I'll do? I will rejoice in the Lord. My confidence is in the Lord. That is lament. Lament is not our final prayer, but it's a prayer in the now, in the meantime, with the hope that God will surely act in the future. So that is some of my thoughts on lament uh, what, that you can see from the Bible and from the Gospel of Luke. For all of us, when we, are, when we are facing the current uh, difficult situation, the tough circumstances before us, let us be reminded that the journey from lament and anguish questioning to robust confidence and resilient faith in God needs to be undertaken and not short-circuited. We need to go through this process of lament so that our hope in God can be deepened and can be sure God is the anchor of our hope. So let's, if we feel the pain, if we lament and pour out to God, let us go through this journey. Let us walk through this journey knowing that this is not our final prayer. Our final prayer, our, our final hope rests in the Lord. And it's a journey that I think is helpful for us to go through, not to be short-circuited. So let me, leave, let me end by leaving a couple of questions. What difference would it make to our own prayer life and our church life if we could meet tragedy, pain, and suffering with prayers of lament? Now, how do we move beyond lament to confidence and hope in God? 
So the good thing about me being the first speaker is I can lay down the questions that I sometimes do not have answers. But I'm sure Dr. Uh, Alex Tang, uh, Bishop Moon Heng, and Dr. Exra Kot will pick some of this thing up and share with us from a spirituality perspective and from pastoral perspective how we can move beyond lament so that we can this confidence and hope in God. Thank you so much. I'll end my uh, sharing here and I will just uh, stop sharing screen and, and go back to Vivian. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Lim, for that wonderful message um, lament in the Gospel of Luke. And it helps us to really put it into perspective and also um, to make meaning out of lament that we're going through, uh, the difficulties that we are facing right now. So um, I would like to uh, now invite Dr. Alex Tang to take on the next segment. Well, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Lim for setting up the foundation and the groundwork, groundwork for uh, this uh, evening's uh, webinar. I think he has uh, done a good, uh, laid a good foundation. And I want to talk about the spirituality of lamentation or lament. But first, I want you to take a deep breath. Just breathe in. Hold it and slowly exhale. And when you do that, I want you to feel what is your general feeling the last 50 day, 53 days of MCO. Or if you have a part of the world that you're in lockdown, what is your feeling? How do you feel? This morning, as I go to the clinic, yeah, I'm a pediatrician. Normally, I would just go straight in the clinic and then call in the first patient. But this morning, when I went into the clinic, I have to go straight to the bathroom because I have to change from my street clothes into scrubs. I have to wash my hand before that, wear the scrub, and then wear my mask and then wear a face shield and wash my hand again before I can see my patient. And when I see my patient, the, I cannot go near them because there's two multi-barrier, my mask, my shield. And I feel sad. And I wish for the days in the past that way I can just be normal, talk to each other, be close to one another. And I begin to realize that things have changed. And that is lamentation. I lament for the good old days. So let me share my PowerPoint with you. And then we can talk about uh, lamentations okay, of so spirituality, as you go on, you can find that they, I find that in lamentation, okay, there are three R's in lamentation that is very powerful. Lamentation reveals certain things that we do not see in normal life. Lamentation removes certain things and lamentation resets our life. So the three R's in lamentation. And we know that the world as we know it have changed. We, the world that <clears throat> we know it in 2019 has crashed and burned. All because of one tiny strand of RNA. Not even DNA, just single strand RNA there is 0 0.025 micron in length. And it brought our whole civilization to a standstill. And we are all in a way in lamentation. So what does it reveal to us about our world? And I want to put it in the context of Jeremiah. 
okay, the prophet Jeremiah and the fall of Jerusalem. And he wrote the book Lamentations, which I think is a very good book to read. And this is a painting of Jeremiah the prophet mourning over the destruction of Jerusalem by Rembrandt. Okay. Rembrandt is one of my favorite artists. Okay. I like his drawing and this is one of the few biblical themes that he focused on. And you can see that Rembrandt is a master, I would say a genius in using of light and darkness. And here you see the prophet Jeremiah moaning. And you can see in the background here, it's a Jerusalem destruction and Jeremiah mourning. And I think that from there, we can learn much about lamentation. Because lamentation reveals things that is happening. It reveals to Jeremiah and Jeremiah and the society of ungodly kings. Okay, Jeremiah served a quite a number of kings, but most of them in Judah. And this is the southern kingdom. And this is a time when the southern kingdom is between Babylonians and the Egyptians. Okay, and both are, are trying to as a control. So you have kings that do not act like kings. Corrupted, evil. And then you have the religious leaders who say that don't worry, everything is okay. Peace, peace, peace. You know, God is in the temple and the temple is in Jerusalem, so nothing can touch you. So don't have to do, just uh, do whatever you want to do and then ask God for forgiveness and all be forgiven. And then you have see the people themselves turn away from God to worship idol and refuse to listen to God. So the lamentation reveals the heart and soul and the whole thing about the society that exists before the fall of Jerusalem. So if you read the book of Jeremiah and study, it's a looking ahead, a book of warning. But you look a book of lamentation, it's looking back, a book of a book of mourning. So lamentation reveals. And what does lamentation in this pandemic reveal to us? Lamentation is actually a grief reaction. We are in grief and we are going through the grief process because we have lost somebody. We have lost something. We have lost a way of life. We have lost a society that think is stable. A society that we, some of us think is paradise. But what the lamentation shows us in this pandemic is that our whole society is based on a, like it's, it's like a house of cards. It's based on lies, based on evil, based on false gods, and more so based on us not living and following the one true God. So yet we long for a return to normalcy. Not only limitation is about being knowing certain things, but knowing and things have been removed from us. Okay? If you go back to the, uh, the fall of Jerusalem, okay? when King Nebuchadnezzar came and besieged Jerusalem, Jerusalem lasts, the siege lasts for 30, 30 months. And it was horrible. I mean, yeah, they were starving. They had, they had no shortage of water because of the well, but they have shortage of food. And we hear that mothers even eat their children. Well, I guess in, in this uh, MCO and all that, we're not too bad. We can still order uh, uh, food in. We don't have to eat our children. Okay, but 
the fall was terrible. And you here you can see the painting itself. You can see here the temple burning. Okay, you can see if you see the arrow, you can see the destruction of Jerusalem. And you can see one man here covering his eyes. Now that is King Zedekiah, the last king of Jerusalem, the last king of, of Judah, when he was caught by Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar forced him to see his sons being killed. So that the last thing he sees is his son being killed. And then Nebuchadnezzar gorged up over his eyes. So that is lamentation. And you see Jeremiah so sad. And Rembrandt has put a book. He was leaning on a book. And scholars believe that that is a book of Jeremiah. But you can see that over here, there are silver objects, golden objects, which most likely Jeremiah has salvaged from the temple before it destroyed. And also the whale, the tapestry from the temple. So you see the destruction and also the trying to retain the old life. And you find that this pandemic has caused us to, lem to have lamentation because we begin to remove all the props that we have built to hold our society up. The society that we think is normal before the pandemic is actually broken. It's broken and it's held together by props and duct tape. And that is a reality. But lamentation also helps us to reset. Because in the deep inside lamentation, there is always a seed of hope. So you look at the book of lamentation. Okay, you see Jeremiah, there are five chapters there, and you can actually divide them equally so that they both reflect each other, what we call charisma. Yeah, chapter one, Jerusalem's desolation, and chapter five, the remnant's response. Chapter two, God's judgment, and chapter four, God's anger. And the middle is Jeremiah's response. And why, in all those horror and terror and destruction, and the hopelessness and fear and terror. And yet in the middle, right in the middle of the book, in, Jer in Lamentation chapter 3, verse 21 to 25, we see these words. This is quite familiar to most of us. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Note that this begins with hope, and it ends with hope. Jeremiah says, this I call to mind, therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For His compassion never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, The Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for Him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in Him. To the one who seeks. So yes, we are in lamentation. Okay, we lament over the present pandemic, but we need to be moving beyond lament and grab hold of the hope that is God, that is full of compassion, that is whose faithfulness never fades and go away, and they are new every morning. So how do we maintain our spirituality in this MCO and post-MCO period? Okay. How do the new normalcy become like? How are we going to do church when the MCO is relaxed and then when we are going to go back? Because it will not be the same again. We can never be church like before. 
Okay, there will be always new restriction. Okay, we still have to do social distancing. You know, I was just reading whether we can sing in church together. Okay, because they, they, uh, scientists have detected that every, when we sing together, and we open our mouth and sing, the choir and the congregation, we expel as much material as when we sneeze. So that means there's no way we can do congregation singing. And when we go to church, we must be distancing. So we can't sit next to each other. So how are we to do church in the new normalcy? How are we? We need to reimagine church. And I just want to uh, recommend this uh, guide to you. Guide, guidance for churches in the coronavirus era, where some thoughts have been placed on how to do church. This is the, you can download it from this uh, uh, URL. How do we imagine church? How will church be the new era? How is business? How is communication? How is work? How is education? There are many changes. And if you think that, oh, you know, uh, when the MCU is lifted, we're going back to life as normal. No, nah, it's not going to happen. Life will never be the same again. And things have changed. Things have changed so much that we do not realize it. Okay? The way we think, the way we learn, has actually been rewired. In this 53 days of pandemic, in the first city, we actually have been undergoing a rewiring of our mind in how we think and live and understand things. We used to think in a linear fashion. But now, because of our confinement and our force to go online for information, we are using connectivism, which is the new theory of learning that we learn from different nodes and source of knowledge and put things together. So you find that when we are released from our lockdown, we'll be thinking differently. And we'll be doing spirituality differently because we have tasted online churches. We have tasted the various things on. Okay. So things have changed. We are not the same anymore. So we are moved on. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that there's no place for uh, beautiful brick and mortar churches. I'm still, yes, we do. But it will be different because we cannot use it as before. But I believe that we have discovered a new horizon, a new area, the new sacred spaces. You know, if you think carefully, what was the thing that's closest to you in this MCO period? That you never leave behind one. Whether you do go to the toilet or you do it, it's always there with you. Not your wife, not your children, your handphone. Okay, we are always checking the news every night, day here and then. The handphone becomes so much a part of our life and the information that flows with us become so much a part of our life. I'm sure that even after the MCO, after the restriction, the new normalcy, we are sort of close to the handful. And I believe that is where the church has expanded to, to cyberspace. And I also believe that there is hope. And for the first time, in the history of the church, we have the ability, the means of grace to reach the ends of the earth. Thank you for listening. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Alex Tang. Thank you for that message of hope. Um, so in the meantime, may I um, uh, invite our next panelist uh, Dr. Reverend Mun Heng, uh, would you be ready to um, share with us? Hello, everybody. Good evening. And I hope that you have uh, a good dinner. And I'm sitting here to listen to every one of us. I'm so glad that uh, 
Dr. Lim Kayong and Dr. Alex Tang has uh, really gone ahead and papers a very exciting and beautiful uh, setup of all this uh, for tonight. And I'm sure there are a lot of food for thought and a lot of things that we can uh, think about. Uh, so I am moving to a different direction, a little bit more on the practical side, uh, especially with church members and and our churches. So um, we'll come to the, the slides now. We all have heard just now very clearly from uh, Dr. Alex Tang about the new normalcy. Things have been difficult. So if you look at the, the next slide, MCO has actually brought about difficulties to many and many are crying but with no tears they cry the tears went inside their lives and they do not know what to do i have many of my churches uh, more than half of my churches are small churches are in the rural places. And all these rural churches and other rural places, their people are not, many of them are not monthly paid. And the self-employed, and many of my churches and the people are self-employed and I'm supposed to be locked down for uh, 50 over days and everybody says that you are you are locked down. You don't have a lot of things to do, but I got a lot. Of, I got a lot of messages, a lot of emails, and saying that what should we do? Uh, we are self-employed. Uh, we have no money. We we can't uh, work and can't sell and can't do anything. And we have in the churches a lot of migrant workers as well, uh, of Nepalese and Myanmar's and uh, Bangladeshi, Pakistan, uh, Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese. So they are not working. And many of them are day pay, daily paid workers. So these are really challenging. And so many of them are small and medium businesses and many are closing. Um, they're closing not because they cannot do anything. They're closing because uh, now nobody is buying the things. One of them will be my brother. Uh, he is closing the shop because uh, you know a couple of years ago they lost the shops to all these big supermarkets, and then the last couple of years they lost the shops to the sales to all these online uh, business. And now when MCO comes in, even worse. So. He is not going to open again because uh, no point. We will lose out everything and must as well close shop. And a lot of them are retail shops, are senior people, which a lot of senior people who do not live in KL, they live in the rural places. The children have left and they have retail shops uh, like watches, uh, you know, selling clothes and all these things uh, they are not doing well. They are our members. People who sell in the wet market are not doing that. Salesmen and saleswomen are also affected because they depend on the sales. Unless those sales can go into, uh, go into uh, online, but a lot of these sales are not online things. So the part-time wages, they which in ages and plantation workers, I have many of these group of people so they are really crying uh, in their own heart, and but no tears. They're really not sure what to do. They have been crying to God. They believe in God. They've been crying. And they are trying very hard to survive. So we try those churches nearby. We try to reach out. But some cannot even reach out to them because uh, they, we, we, we don't have people to go so far away. The next slides will bring us to these difficulties. 
move on to the next slide. And the people need food, essentials. And now when MCO is going to be over, they're thinking of bills and loans, and car loans, uh, house loans, and they have so many business loans. These are really struggling, really bad. And I'm not sure what's the best answer for them when they write to me. I try to encourage them. So family needs, they now suddenly uh, husband and wife have to be at home, work from home, and now they have to look after the children. And those children, you know, they have the children issue, and they have husband and wife issue, and they have, you know, to look after the home, and suddenly so much time together, and they have never planned that way. And the elderly uh, suddenly have been there all the time, and usually a lot of nagging, a lot of complaints, a lot of things. So things are not right uh, too many. Some are very good, but not many. The youth have their own issue. Now a lot of them end up, and I have phone calls, and I have emails, and I have WhatsApp, and they say that uh, they are always on the handphone. Uh, some end up in gambling, in the internet, online gambling, some on pornographic, and some only on uh, movies and movies and movies and movies, uh, not doing nothing at home. So these are real issues. And the parents or sometimes the youth are crying because the parents are doing it. Or sometimes the parents are crying, the youth are doing it. Sometimes the elderly are crying because their children are doing it. And some youth are crying because, you know, uh, they are not taken care of. Health and hygiene care is always there. Suddenly, they, everybody had to be so cautious. And they, there is a tendency that they want to throw away everything. They want to go out and say, uh, you know, actually not so, not so serious. But then everybody is telling, no, 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 no. Keep your distance, keep your distance, put your mask, wash your hands, and go out and come back and take shower and clean, change your set of clothes. And it was never done before like that. And now suddenly have to be very conscious. And some are so panicked and they do not even want to go out at all. And counseling has been uh, challenging things because we are not there, only here say, so we are not present. We do not know the details. So we can only counsel as much as on the surface. We can't go really deep down, uh, but we try to. There are a lot of people who are so fearful. Church members are very fearful. People do not know what is happening. After hearing that there is a new normalcy, everything like Dr. Tan, uh, Alex Tan has said, that, that uh, they will not be, dif will be different, will not be the same. And so there is so much fear in them. And then some of them is, has uh, experienced uh, death in the family and they don't have support. Not like last time, got a lot of people can come, they just, nobody can come. And so they just have to do the service and the burial very quietly, very privately. And a lot of insecurity and uncertainty in the future. And I know that in the Anglican Church in West Malaysia, uh, all these things are going to be very badly affected because uh, offerings are not coming in. We have to suddenly switch everything online. So those who are able to do online things are easy half of them have no access to all these online things. They do not know how to do it. And so uh, they actually can't, can't relate and connect very well with everyone. The best is still on the phone. You can call them on the phone, uh, talk to them. Uh, apart from that, very hard to find. They have no Wi-Fi or good Wi-Fi uh, to, to do those things. And many, many articles are going around and everybody calling me up, is it end time? Is it end time? You know, is it the, you know, the, the, the internet? The next time everybody go into the internet, will they end up in the 666? You know, the revelation is talking about it, controlled by the whole world. And uh, now with all the issues of USA and China, and with all the things you blame me, I blame you and blame everybody. So they always ask and say, Bishop, which is right? Which one to follow? 
I'm not sure you receive this. You know, you say, which is follow. So your word is almost like, you know, the, the, the final authority, like the buck stops here, you know. So very carefully to say, which is right, which is not right. Is it end time? Is it the time uh, where Jesus is coming back? You know, what should we do? We are not ready. You know, um, my children is like that. My husband is like that. My wife is like that. My parents eh? and so many are not safe yet. What should we do? Uh, so these are all challenges. And it is like a lament in them and they knew God, and but then they do not know what to do. They say, God, please help. So they always ask, pray for the peace. Pray for protection, pray for health, pray for care, pray for everything. So what shall we do? Let's move to the next slide. You know, the churches are now are facing real difficulty. And I think that after the MCO, we will probably have lose uh, one third of the churches. I think we have no choice but to close one third of the churches. Uh, all the Anglican church on West Malaysia, we have 160 plus churches. I think we will go to close about one third of them, as far as I know. The run, one of the re real reason is because offerings are not coming in. Because many of the churches have not prepared online offering and there's no, you know, not, not time to even to set up any online offerings. And then, then we think of the salary of the workers paying the bills and utilities. And as you know, in Malaysia, many of our churches are in shops and in houses. We had to pay rent. And we, we not, of course, all the old churches during the British days, we don't have to pay rent. It's already there. But the uh, new ones are considering that. And when the, when the when MCO is over, we do not know what will happen. So what do we do first? Do we pay the bills and rental or forget about the salaries or salary first? So these are going to be very, very serious. And then they, there will be a lot of uh, fear. A lot of pastors are calling up saying that, uh, you know, uh, we will be losing members to the larger churches because those who can go into online, they have really listened. Sometimes they choose which, which service to listen to, which preacher to listen to. Uh, never did before that, and now they, have, they can choose. They can choose even overseas preacher. But not so much uh, the choosing of the things are more in English group and maybe some of the Chinese group. Uh, but the VM group and the Tamil group may be lesser of that kind. But then uh, people are also worried. Because some will lose out to the bigger churches who can hand out. We have some aids to give to. You know, we are also doing quite a lot of this in certain areas. But uh, but they're not, not every church are doing it because no, there's no means to do it. So the question asks, you know, what will happen? So I have to frantically had to go and yes, ask for funds in order to prop up, at least for this year, we will see what we can do, prop up, but we will not be the same anymore uh, for a long time. So then they ask question when the churches can be open, when it is open, will it be the same? I say, let's wait for it and see. Will the church able to sustain herself? And that is a real big question. Big churches, maybe we can still manage, but the smaller churches are really affecting, very badly affected. So we move on to the next slide. You know, but God has an answer in the scripture. And I say to them the same thing. And I quote this from Benny, Benny Cosby. He says, God will answer your prayers better than you think. Of course, one will not always get exactly what he has asked for. We all have sorrows and disappointments, but one must never forget that if commended to God, they will issue in good. His own solution is far better than any we could conceive. Those are the words that we can say and the only encouragement is just pray to God, trust Him. And the people ask the question, trust until when? When if there's no food? When if there's no way to pay the bills? When, when MCO is over, my car has to be towed away? You know, uh, when 
my house have to be you know given up and so because no way to pay the loan no way to pay uh, all the expenses so these are the challenges but i want to move on to next slide and to encourage us so that uh, we use psalm 1 no, I'll read to you Psalm, the whole of Psalm 1. And we would, I'm sure you are familiar with it. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in seasons, and its leaves does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. If you look at verse 3, and we all like the verse 3, you know, he is like a tree planted by stream of water that yields its fruit in seasons and its leaves does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Which word stands out to you? Many years ago, when I read this long time ago, and it's always the word that stands out to me is the word prosper. I like this psalm because it says, oh, in all that he does, he prospers. And I enjoy the word prospers. But during this MCO, I memorize this psalm again, and I repeat and read every day. I re repeat the psalm uh, in different languages. And then I come back to the word. He says that uh, is the word season. Uh, the word season clicks me. He says he is like a tree planted by streams of water that use his fruit in, in its season which means there will be season that is no fruit. There will be season that it is drought. So I like to see that, you know, if, you know, if the tree is in, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, in the colder countries, it will be summer, spring, uh, winter, and autumn. And the tree is still there with different seasons. There will be time of different seasons of storms. There will be seasons of uh, drought. There will be seasons of fire. There will be seasons of snow. There will be seasons of all kinds. But the psalmist tells us that, you know, there will be different seasons. But God is watching, my dear. Then I look at the word prosper after the se word season, the word prosper. What does he mean prosper? If God, if I pray to God and he protect me, and so my family all protected, nobody died of coronavirus. So is that prosperity? Or if, if one, some, some, one person in my family got coronavirus and then he went through uh, quarantine and, and, and been healed in the hospital, and then he came out, he didn't die. So is that prosperity? Or if one person died out of 10, he still prosper? Because not two people died, not four people died, not six people died. So how do we measure that? So we are going to move to the next slide. The answer here is, uh, I believe, I prayed and God told, I have I've said the same thing to the members who have asked me and called me. I say, focus not on the byproducts, but the real product. The byproducts are, you know, in the tree, that the tree there, the byproducts will be the fruit, will be the leaves. The real product is the tree, the roots will be beside streams of water. And they will draw all the minerals and all the nutrition, even during drought days, because it's so deep in the root. When the water of the river may have dropped so low, but it was down, still moist down there. 
or even during the cold days when it is ice, but the day gets you draw the moist, or even when the three days are you know storms are there, and you can still draw the substance and minerals. So, but a lot of time our prayers and I told the people, you know, move away our focus from byproducts to real product. Our byproducts are, you know, we pray for healing, we pray for joy, we pray for peace, we pray for protection, we pray for care, we pray for health, we pray for blessing, we pray for success, we pray for so many things, we this is a byproduct. Very good things and we should be praying. And then if we move to the next slide, these are the byproducts. Happiness, peace, joy, victory, promotion, confidence, comfort, relaxation, name, and fame. So these are all the byproducts. But if we focus on the byproduct, then we will, we will miss the point. Because God says, all these things will be given to you if you are like that. We are planted next to the streams of water. So we move another slide. He says, like a tree. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaves does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. He's, he's concentrating here. The Sami says that he's like a tree, that tree that planted by streams of water. That's the real product. The real product that it is always in connection with the water and always in con contact and in contactivity together with the water, with the streams. And that is where the strength, there's the minerals, that is where the, the moist, and that is all the substance that you need was drawn from there. But somehow, we have been concentrating in the wrong thing, the focus on the byproducts. He says that if you are planted by the streams of water, the fruits will come in this season. The leaves will come in this season. And you will prosper. Prosper in the sense that you will remain even drought, even fire, even storm. You will remain because he is with us. So I want to move on to the next slide. What's the real product? The real product here, I have copied these photos from the internet. He says that, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and his law, in his law does he meditate day and night. It is the word of God. It is to know God. It is God himself. The real product for the tree, the real product is beside the streams of water. For Christian, the real product is Jesus Christ. The word of Jesus. The word became flesh. He says, if you know the word, you know that the word is truth. If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword that will understand you very well. And the word of God that has gone out will never come back void. And the word of God is true, is strong. So that's a real product. So we have to encourage our members again, and I have to encourage them, says that stay firm in the word of God and the Lord and keep praying. And I can't reach you now, but the Lord can reach you. And so this is the real product. And we have not, we have chosen rightly. We have not gone wrongly. And we have heard from Dr. Eric Stang that uh, the people of Jerusalem during Jeremiah's time, you know, they have the temple. They have the faith. They have the law of God. They have everything, but they move away. Today, we need to move back to God, meditate His Word day and night, allow His Word to dwell in us. If we have the Word of God in our heart, we will not sin against Him. 
we move to the next slide. The next slide is the real product is to know God. Seasons will come, will change, storms will come and go, but God's word will never change and will never pass away. God did not promise us that there will be no suffering. God did not promise us that there will be no sickness. God did not promise us that we will not die. But he promised that he will be with us. And all the things in the world will change. But he says his word will never change. Not even one dot of his word will perish. And then we move on one more slide. To know God is to keep his word and obey his commands. So I will encourage my church members and my members who lost a lot of things and who have no future. The one who keeps God's word and obey him is inseparably connected. It will be perfected and walks with him. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 to 6. To know God is to keep his word and obey his command. Deuteronomy tells us we must keep the word of God and obey his command. And then all these things will come. But if we don't, he says, even sicknesses or virus will come. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you very much, Bishop. And thank you. And may I now invite um, Dr. Ezra Koch? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, especially for Kayong to organize uh, this webinar. Thank you for the sharing to start off with the message of lament and then a friend Alex for sharing with us on the Old Testament spirituality. Bishop, uh, very down to earth uh, address on this issue. Now my sharing is very simple. I try to address on the uh, lament and followed by the church. So my sharing is more on the practical side. Uh, so by the time when Malaysia declared the uh, MC, uh, so my sharing is a bit more on the pastoral side, uh, how we deal with the issue and how we look at that and then uh, do whatever we can. Right? Let me begin with the crisis, lament and prayers. Uh, when we were caught in the MCO, it was just about the time when we are going to prepare ourselves for the Passion Week. And one of the scripture reading at that time uh, is to reflect on Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. According to God, the Gospel of Mark chapter 14, 32 to 42, and Jesus praying, you know, Abba, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. I think I would like to even to imitate the prayer of Jesus. God, can you take the virus away? It is, it's something that we are very caught uh, unprepared and not ready to face it. And just like uh, Gayong mentioned earlier on, in the Old Testament, Prophet Abacook uh, crying out to God, O oh Lord, Lord, shall I cry for help? And all the why, why, why carry on? Uh, I've gone to the next slide already, Vivian, please. Um, so it's, it's a bit like um, we are caught in those questions and then sometimes in our, deep in our heart, you know, we are asked a question, what does it mean by prayer? Does God really hear our prayers? Is prayer answered? And people sometimes even ask, you know, how should I pray? Because for many times or many years, we are told uh, the moment you pray in Jesus' name, your 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 prayers will be answered. But it's not as simple as that. For quite some time, you know, we live in comfort zone and our faith is not really tested. And this time, this period is really a, a testing time for us. But I want to move on to the second part. Be positive and never say die. You know, this is what I learned from uh, Kayong. Huh? We, we, when we are in STM, we always joke about this. Never say die. Huh? Uh, so actually at the beginning of this year, uh, in my uh, Chinese annual conference, we are talking about digital adoption. We are saying that this year we must work on it and how we move our ministry 
and our administration, everything you know, to be more on the high tech. But while we are talking about that in January, we didn't actually expect uh, we are forced upon it. So very quickly, when we are caught in this uh, MCO, uh, have to diam, to to diam, diam the rumor, we we go back to the last last slide. Um, we we have to uh, get ourselves organized and move our things on the digital side. So it's a good thing when the church cannot gather, but in fact the church is dispersed. We are spread you know, all over every place because we can't meet in one place, but we can still meet and worship online. And suddenly, you know, Christians become everywhere and we become dynamic. With, and also we move many of our ministry to the online mode. We have our prayer meetings, Bible studies, groups, fellowships, meetings, and so on. And we also have to organize ourselves how to do pre-recorded uh, Sunday worship, uh, so many of our pastors uh, in the past are not very IT savvy, but now suddenly we become uh, more and more experienced in it. I think this is roughly the situation. Uh, we, don't, we don't want to uh, surrender. We don't want to give up. We just have to be positive and think out of the box and continue to move on and, and to do our ministry. Then the next thing is that we will look at is the action. Uh, to me, this passage from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16, uh, is very important for the church, uh, for the ministry. Be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. The church exists not for themselves, for ourselves, but for the world. How can we be useful and how can we be beneficial, bring positive changes, uh, impact to the world? The other passage is from Paul in the, God, uh, in the letter to, to the Galatians, chapter 6, verse 10. And Paul says that let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So what we do, for example, in our church, uh, in the Methodist church, uh, we have this wing called the Methodist Crisis Relief and Development. In short, MCRD is our social, ex social concern here in action. Now, my brother, uh, Jacob Lee, uh, has been spearheading this wing, uh, doing a lot of uh, fundraising and also distributing uh, the PPE to many public hospitals. So very quickly during the crisis, uh, when we heard of uh, public hospitals are running short of those uh, uh, equipments or those uh, protective uh, garments, uh, our brother, uh, search all the way you know, to China, where to buy those uh, PPE, and then have to arrange for the import of those things to Malaysia, and find out logistics, how to send uh, those uh, PPE to the different hospitals, uh, including uh, East Malaysia. Uh, thank God uh, for the Methodist Church because of our, our big network. Uh, we have churches all over Malaysia, including Sarawak, and therefore, through the connection, we are able uh, to help to distribute some of those things uh, to the others. Uh, at the same time, when we talk about love in action, we also want to do uh, for those who are poor and needy. We gather that there are people uh, who are running short of food. Uh, the moment we stop work, we uh, almost have to uh, no income to buy food. So through this MCRD, we try our best uh, to provide some food stuff to those refugees, OA community, uh, migrant workers, and the families as well. So we want to uh, remind ourselves as a church, we have to be the salt and the light of the world. And then let me bring uh, to the fourth point uh, regarding our church members. Uh, when we talk about doing good to others. We cannot forget our own family household, especially in Galatians chapter 6, uh, chapter six verse 10, the second half. You know, Paul reminds us of our own people, those of the household of faith. Now, as Christians, we have to be honest. We can also forsake. We may have family members or friends who are affected by the virus. And we also have worry and fear. Now, so we have to 
provide pastoral care uh, to our church members. We encourage our pastors to pray for those brothers and sisters. Uh, in the past, we can easily go for house visitation, but now we are not able to move around freely. But even then, so we will say that use our phone uh, in a way that call them and pray with them. At the same time, we also heard of some people who may have financial crisis you know, because of not able to work. And sometimes uh, we also have uh, run into difficulty you know, to feed ourselves. So we encourage our churches to set aside some money uh, for the poor and need. So for the church members, if they really need help, uh, the churches, the local churches, uh, will do their best to uh, assist uh, those in need. So pastoral care for our members is one of the things that uh, I emphasize very much uh, in our church. Uh, for the last three days, you know, I've been uh, contacting our pastors. Uh, in the past, you know, have pastors up in the north, down in the south, in the east, and so on. Uh, but because of the MCO, I cannot move freely, uh, but we can have Zoom meeting to meet up all the pastors uh, all over the country. And so we talk about, we share about uh, how we provide our pastoral care to those people. Uh, we call them, we, we pray with them, and we also want to move on. Uh, though we cannot meet in physically in one place, uh, it's a good time actually to help us to uh, emphasize on the family. Let the family be our one of the very uh, important part of our church life. So we encourage our members to have family altar, family worship at home, uh, have more home-based uh, fellowship, and also to encourage our church members in the time of crisis, do spend time you know, to pray to God, to spend time, have our observe our quiet time, and for long term, a long time, uh, basic Bible study skills is very important. Uh, that's the only way uh, when we or pastors cannot uh, go to them in person, but at least you know, they can survive spiritually if they know how to read the Bible for themselves and they can pray for one another on their own. Now, so these are some of the things that we would like to do and we are transferring some of our ministry online and we want to grow in spirituality. Uh, as I say earlier on, uh, we never say die. As the people of God, the, the Easter people of God, we celebrate the Easter, you know, God's act you know, in, in the world through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so we want to move on celebrating God's grace and action in the world. So that's uh, briefly, uh, short, that's my sharing with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Cock, and thank you for the wonderful me message of encouragement um, to all the churches and also to individual. Uh, thank you very much. And now I'd like to just let me stop. And it's time for us to um, move on to our Q&A. I am looking at our questions. We have the highest vote of 52 for this question. Is lament and faith contradictory in spirituality, yes. Uh, I don't think so. I think it's all part of the, our spiritual journey. Okay, I mean there are uh, good times and bad times, as a bishop says. You know there are seasons of life, and uh, part of our spirituality or our spiritual life is to go through the good times and the bad times. Remember, uh, Job. Okay, Job uh, was afflicted to all this illness, so much so that the wife says, why don't you curse God and die? Mm. And, and Job answered, woman, you do not know what you do, are saying. If we accept all the good things from the Lord, why not the bad things? And I think that that is a very important part of our spirituality. The Christian life is not just all good things. There are also good things and bad things. And we are here to know God and to glorify God, to become like Jesus Christ. And we can only succeed in this journey if we go through good times, but also 
lamentation. Okay, and lamentation doesn't mean that you do not believe in God. Okay, lamentation is finding God in the midst of all the terrible things that's happening to you. Remember, lamentations, the book I just shared in the middle of the book where God is. That's my answer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. That's um, um, yeah, very um, meaningful answer for us to take on board and to start thinking of Job's situation. So we have the next questions here. Um, we have Chong here asking, how should we view biblical examples of laments that seem to not have any signs of hope, eschatological or otherwise? Example, Psalms 88. Okay, thank you for that. Great question. In fact, um, Psalm 88 has often been known to be the only psalm uh, that is completely full of lament and is very depressive if you read it. There is no hope at all as it were. But one of the things that when we read Psalms, we have to bear in mind is that we, may not, we should not be, be taking one psalm out and forget to know what comes before or after. So if you look at, if you have your Bibles, if you turn to Psalm 88, you will see right before verse 1, right? At the top, it says a song, a psalm of the sons of Korah, from the director music, according to Mahala uh, Lenoth, a muscle of Herman the Ezrahite. A muscle we don't know, is probably some literally or musical phrase. Is a musical uh, or literary phrase of Herman the Ezraite. If you move to Psalm 89, it says right at the top, it's a muscle of Ethan the Ezraite. So you actually see these two Psalms are written by the Ezraite. That gives us a clue that Psalm 88 and Psalm 89 probably should have been read together rather than reading Psalm 88 again together. So if you put Psalm 88 and Psalm 89 together, you will see Psalm 88 is completely uh, lamenting with no hope. But the minute you go to Psalm 89, you see the tune changes completely. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness. You'll make your faithfulness known throughout all generations. I will declare that your love stands forever and that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. Then if you call Reading that, you see the psalmist changes his tone. No, the Ezra hide one lament and one give praise to God and declare that God is faithful. So if you put these two psalms together, one is lamenting, one is declaring the faithfulness of God. So we have to see these two together. It's as if like the both sides of the same coin. So hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend uh, Dr. Lim. Uh, let's go to our last question. Uh, this last question is by um, Peter Raj. Is lament an optional or required practice of the faith? i like to go back to, if you have uh, able to read some of the literature of the second century uh, AD, which is very few. Um, the, after, after our Bible, Paul, Peter, and the rest of the apostles were all uh, martyred, and the churches were all scattered uh, due to persecution by the Roman emperor. And the, um, the, the persecution went very, very great, and the whole empire later on became pers uh, under persecution, for, and Christians were under persecution. So you read some of these uh, literature, uh, in the second century when people write, very few of them, and they are actually uh, more of a lament than of the faith, uh, positive faith, because they cannot see a positive things. And number one, if I if may allow me to say, the Christians at that time was outlaw, so they had to run away. And number two, they if they get caught, uh, they either been killed, or they have been put into the lion's den to fight with the lions in the arena for people to see, or they are to be that uh, they are thrown into the gladiators for people to like sports for them to see. 
So they, they really have to ask themselves at that time, do they still want to believe God? So if they believe God, what positive things will come out? So I read some of the literature. There was no positive things. They cannot see any light at the end of the tunnel yet. It takes until Emperor Constantine to come in in 313 AD. So in the, in the 200 odd AD time, there was no positive signs. But then we heard from this, on this writing, so many great leaders that have come out during this period of time, and they continue to write with books and literature to encourage the Christians to carry on. So in this sense, that is actually, uh, you know, sense of uh, lament will come during the time when it is most difficult. And they just like faith, hoping there's something to come. Faith is during the time I would like to see in the times when things, you can still see a light. You can still hope to come, to see come through. You get like an option is still there. But the men, they have seen in the, like in the darkness, they have not seen. Today in MCO, we have not seen these things. But I read some, let me ask, answer the last part. And I read some literature, uh, the Bishop Daniel Wilson of our bishop in, uh, in Singapore at that time, during the Japanese war, uh, he and uh, Reverend uh, John Hater and all these priests were caught by the uh, Japanese and put into Katsangi prison. They were there for three years, eight months, uh, roughly there. So they wrote, and in fact, they suffered very badly. They were bruised and they and it came out. They didn't last too long. And then they passed away uh, very young. So when they were caught in, they were writing, you know, of course, when they wrote, when the things is over. But during the time, the time was so dark. But they still baptize people in the prison. They still do communion in the prison. They still carry on everything in the prison. Even though the prison did not allow they hide themselves, go to the bathroom and sprinkle a little bit of water on each other and there is baptism. And when they eat rice, you books written there and everybody look at each other when he scoop one spoon of rice and every, it's like the communion bread. And then they drink what the tea together, it's like communion wine and their heart pray to it. So he wrote all these things. He says that we do not know whether we can survive and come out or not. So that is like a lament in them uh, in a very dark time. I would like to put it as lament is the dark side or the dark time of faith. Faith is the, you know, you can still see a little bit of positiveness. So it, that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with us. And I think um, that's all the time we have for um, the few questions. And I know there are many other great questions uh, in the Q&A box. Uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to go through um, uh, many more. All right. With, with that, uh, I thank you, our panelists, and thank you for the team of um, people who work behind scenes to make this possible. And we also thank our colleagues who um, make the point to come in and, and be here in this event with us. And also thank you to our panelists. And it's been wonderful sharing and all the messages been very encouraging to us. So thank you very much. And we hope to run uh, many more sessions here. And so stay tuned with us and we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you.